welcome to UCSD Guestbook. My name is Ivan Schuller. I'm from the physics department at UCSD. My guest today is Professor Harry Croto from Sussex University. He is the 1996 Nobel Prize winner for chemistry for the discovery of carbon-60. Professor Croto, welcome to UCSD. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be here. Since last time I saw you, um, many things happened in your life. One of the things uh, you were knighted by, uh, by, I guess, the Queen of England. I'm wondering what, uh, what is the proper etiquette to address you? Uh, should we call you Sir Harold or Harold well, Sir? Well, I, I would hope that everybody still calls me Harry. I've not changed, but if you uh, look at the protocol, apparently it is Professor Sir Harold Croto, okay. which raises a big smile on the faces of my friends. And as I said before, those who don't know me, they're impressed by that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to ask you uh, if you could uh, describe us very briefly what was this uh, discovery of the Buckminster Fuller in, and what is this? Uh, what are we really talking about? Well, it's a fairly unusual discovery at the end of the twentieth century um, because it's it's so fundamental. If one looks at the elements of the periodic table, many have been known for a long time. I mean, carbon's been known for. Or aeons. I mean, our earliest ancestors knew of carbon and graphitic materials, but from soot and things like this. And diamond, of course, has been found, and that's been known to the ancients. And these are two forms of carbon. They look very different, but they're the same atoms of carbon. And we discovered a third form, which has this beautiful structure, in which the atoms are located um, on a, a surface which is rather similar to that of a soccer ball. So if you put an atom at these positions, which you'll find there are 60 in the case of a soccer ball, you get this molecule. And that was a totally unexpected uh, discovery, um, which we found by accident. And so can you put it to us uh, within the context of uh, chemistry? Where does, this, uh, you know, where does this fit into the context of general chemistry, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, well, physics? Yes, it does now. It didn't at the time, I mean, because no one really appreciated that you could make a three-dimensional uh, structure, uh, in fact, an architecture on a, on a microcosmic scale involving atoms. And uh, up till then, it was assumed that graphite was the most stable form and that it would always be flat. But what we found, and I think is the perspective, the change in perspective, is that if you make a graphite sheet, which is all the atoms in a hexagonal pattern, if we look on this case, and graphite is a sheet just of hexagons, if you can see it here. So you can make a sheet of hexagons like that. It will be flat. But if you put pentagonal structures into it, it will form a ball. And that just was not expected uh, to be uh, an easy thing to do. But it turns out that if you just take 60 carbon atoms and says, you know, do what you want, they will form a cage. And that was a big discovery. I mean, I think uh, Osawa, a Japanese, had actually thought of this structure and said if you could make it, it would be stable. What nobody thought of is that it would just form itself. And that was very, un very surprising. And it's changed chemistry from a flat area to an area now that we know is actually three-dimensional and has, has these cage uh, possibilities. Is this a nationalistic kind of a thing, or what is the reason for this ball in the...? <laughs> well, I mean, it's uh, actually international. I, like, I don't like nationalism. I like internationalism. And if anything is international, I think the soccer ball is. And this is the most recent form of it. I mean, this structure is only since the 60s uh, in which we have these 12 pentagons and the hexagons. Um, in the old days, the soccer ball was rather like a, um, a, a um, basketball. It had that same structure. But this is the new form, and this is the international football or soccer ball. Um, not nationalistic, I don't think. <laughs> so uh, can you describe for us uh, this discovery? What is the scientific impact of this discovery? Ordinarily, when one talks about scientific uh, discoveries, usually in most programs, TV programs, on the most discussions in the public press, we talk about scientific impact, and then we talk about some application. Yes. And I would like to ask you about, actually, about the scientific impact, the purely scientific impact. Well, the, the, the pure scientific impact is that it has changed our view of what carbon chemistry, organic chemistry can do. It, it has added a significant new dimension. We now know that we can make a whole new set of compounds with these cage structures. We can, let's look at it for instance. It's actually an extremely rigid structure. It is the, hard, it's the toughest molecule that's, that's been made. We can bounce it off surfaces at huge energies before it will break up. We can put atoms on the inside. 
So Does one it roll? I noticed that uh, it's round. Does yes, it roll? Um, not obviously. Um, no. If you ask, does it roll? It may roll on a single on a surface, but the, when we get down to molecular dimensions, it's more like um, the billiard balls that, that are stacked together. If you put one on top of the other, they actually have they actually don't roll easily. Um, it actually does rotate, but rolling is something is not obviously that so something. You wouldn't think that it's a good lubricant. Also? Well, it isn't uh, uh, apparently a good lubricant, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly not by itself. I mean, the one somehow the first reaction that one has is that it will be a good lubricant. Yeah, that's what we thought in the paper. We wrote that in our discovery paper, and the first experiment that I did, personally, all of it, all by myself, was as soon as I had some pure C60 in 1990, is I took a spatula and squeezed it, and it was nothing like graphite. In fact, graphite is very odd material. Mm -hmm. um, we, in fact, I got a, a letter recently which said that graphite is not a lubricant on the space shuttle. Right. And that means that we don't understand the, graphitic, the lubrication properties of graphite. It's not quite as the textbooks say. But, I mean, it does roll, but it doesn't act as a good lubricant. And I think ro because if you think of putting balls on, turf, on, a, on a billiard table, when you put them in the triangle, right, you put the, the others in the, in the dips between the balls, and they don't actually roll. They hop from one place to the other, and that is a rigidity rather than a lubricative property. Actually, this reminds me of the, the there is some stories around that Kekulé's uh, discovery was he, he was dreaming one night, and he thought of a snake biting its tail or something like that. Is there, is there a, do you, did you have a dream like this or something? No, not quite. L let me first say something about this discovery. What we, what we did, I mean, it was Bob Curl and Rick Smalley were the two senior scientists with myself, and Jim Heath, Sean O'Brien, and Yuan Liu were the students who were working on that project. Um, we accidentally discovered that there was something special about an aggregate of, of 60 carbon atoms. What was it? And the um, ideas that started to gel were that possibly a cage had been made. But it was a, probably a graphitic cage and just a hexagon. Then we thought of Buckminster Fuller's domes and also a star dome that, I, that I'd made. And we brought this together. And then Rick uh, started playing with. You mean Curl? Uh, no, Rick Smalley Rick's started pl playing with one night, uh, cutting out hexagons. And I said, well, you know, this structure doesn't have only hexagons, it has pentagons as well. And then he remembered about the pentagons and started to cut those out, and then it curved into a sphere, and it, it worked very nicely. And it turned out that it was the soccer ball. Incidentally, the story about Kekulé is now coming under some uh, careful scrutiny. Oh. Because I read it in my first chemistry class. Yeah, that but it turns out that Lushmit, the famous yes. Lushmit, who was mm -hmm. a physics and um, thermodynamics, had actually published the ring structure of benzene four years beforehand in a book which Kekulé apparently had seen. So oh. this icon of discovery is a bit suspect and um, needs uh, to be looked at more carefully. But there's, it's no doubt that the ring structure was published four years before Kekulé. And that story was um, related by Kekulé 25 years after his presentation. So it's a bit suspect and should not be taken historically, as it is almost always, as an example of how um, a solution to a, a scientific problem is uh, actually comes about. Can you say something about now about what people usually are very interested in, which is uh, knowing what is the applied impact of what, what do you do you view any applied impact of this? Or? Well, I'm not the best person for that because I'm a fundamental scientist. I'm I like to just see how things. Uh, work. I mean, I, it's like going down the road like an explorer. You say there's something interesting here, but I don't have a goal. I mean, maybe Columbus had a goal to go around, the, you know, right. to go around and find in, um, India or whatever by going around the world. And then he discovered the serendipity was the USA. One wonders should he have bothered? I don't know. You never, <laughs> <laughs> you never. But anyway, that. that's a so uh, uh, the discovery of America is a fundamental discovery for goal-oriented study. So it's serendipitous. Um, but um, there are a number of interesting aspects of C60. And one is that um, it has curious energetic properties. It can store energy a lot longer than other molecules. And one of the possibilities is that it will be a component in the next generation of computers when we think of molecular computers. And if we think of molecular computing, we're thinking in 
um, chips which are a hundred times smaller in one dimension and a million times smaller in volume. Somehow the thing that occurs to one always one looks at this molecule and thinks maybe I should stick something inside of it. Yeah, that too. So it is possible yeah. to stick atoms on the inside mm -hmm. and that's a holy grail. Um, for instance, with potassium you can make C60 a, a, compute, a superconductor and uh, if you can put a, an, an atom on the inside the view is that this, some of these atoms can make the C60 um, solid a high temperature superconducting yes. phase. That's, a, that's a, one thing that is looking very interesting. Um, the other thing, of course, is that you can trap, say, a, a, a radioactive element which is um, toxic on the inside and then put groups on the outside which will target a particular part, part of the body. So you can then say, okay, put the atom on the inside where it's just captured, it's not bound, and can't get out. So its toxic properties are going there, and then it can go to the point and then decay and just hit that particular site. So that's a, one, another exciting possibility. Um, as you know, uh, something that really amazed me about you always is, is your special rapport that you have with children. As you know, uh, my two kids have come to your uh, lecture, and both of them had the reaction that... Uh, this is a cool dude. <laughs> so, uh, wh what, 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 can you tell us how come you have this special rapport? You seem to be involved in a variety of uh, programs with children. Uh, you seem to enjoy this also a lot. It's not like you're doing it for obligation. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, one seems to have a better rapport with other people's kids than one's own. <laughs> I yes. discovered uh, this difficulty. Um, well, kids are, young kids are incredible. Um, Do you have children of your own? Yes, of course. They're now 30 years old, oh, so, and, um, but, um, so they're no longer kids. The uh, kids of, of about 8 or 9 or 10 are wonderful. Kids of about 18 and 19 are, are, are great too, but in the middle they, they have some problems and when they're 14 and 12, which is a bit unfortunate. But I like the younger kids because they'll ask questions, they were not inhibited, and they, they don't have any respect for you, your name or who you are, you've got to perform on, on time. And they can ask crazy questions and um, I, I think just to see them fascinated by things which don't, they're not fascinated by things that have applications, they just have this intrinsic interest in structures like this and they can just make them for their own benefit. So why is it that these very same children, and this is something that one actually occurs to me right now, why is it that these very same children have that have these fascinations when they become older and they become our leaders, or as you said in your lecture, our politicians, how can they lose this fascination? What's, what's going on here? Well, I, I think, I think the, the politicians I have a problem with because they've had to go through a period of um, uh, losing their, their real ethics uh, to get to those positions. I mean, I, I, you know, I, mean I, I, I'm, I won't say that strongly, but I think there is a problem of getting to positions of power and um, I don't think any r scientist, real scientist, would really become a politician because the problems there are too complicated. Um, you know, I, I must sort of be careful about what I say. Um, we have to, scientists have to be involved in these socioeconomic problems, but if you say you, you want to solve socio-political, socio-economic problems, these are so multivariable that if you took a problem in the in the natural world, in, in the scientific problem, you wouldn't really tackle it because you would never know whether you were right or wrong. No, I'm more curious about the fact that, you know, politicians uh, sort of, uh, the children are very curious, they are interested, you show them a yes. thing like this, they start building, then you get to a politician and they blank out completely on you, it seems like, or something. Is there anything oh, that we, we are doing wrong? about our education of the public or do you have well, any opinions almost, about this? Almost certainly that's true. Mm -hmm. I mean one thing is certainly true is that we don't know how to retain that curiosity. I mean kids are inherently curious. They'll do anything, they'll play and play is always the thing. The problem is that to carry on playing when we put them through the stress of having to take exams and things like this that's a major problem. Now they don't do these things because they're curious. They do them because they have to to get a job. And so one changes the, the perspective they have. I don't think we know how to educate our kids. I'm absolutely sure about that. Um, I was put under this tremendous pressure, but you put another kid under that pressure and they will wilt. I mean, one thing I have is a resilience. I mean, I don't claim to be 
necessarily a great scientist, although it appears so because we, I've got this accolade. I feel I'm a very, very good scientist, but there's some fantastic, wonderful, and amazing people that I've, I've met. But I do have a resilience, and I do have something which I don't know where it comes from. It, I think it comes from something, parent pressure, that I never put in a bad job. I don't, it'll be as good as I can do, and it may not be as good as someone else can do, but it's the best I can do. Otherwise, I probably won't tackle it, and so mm -hmm. I, I don't give in very easily. And right. I think that's important, and, and that's something that is needed in science. And many kids who are curious, when they, they don't have that, they're great and they're clever, and you know many scientists, yes. So, yes. but they don't have that determination to continue. And I think you, it, it's, again, this thing, determination is very important to succeed. But Let me ask you this. There, there, um, uh, it seems like uh, the discovery, I don't exactly remember the year, but it was somewhat of a long time 1985. ago. 1985. 1985, and now we're in 1997. It's been a long time ago that the discovery of carbon-60, and pretty much everybody agreed that this was carbon-60, I presume, very early on. Mm, not really. No, well, I think the first yes. year there were several significant papers saying right. that the experiment wasn't right. But eventually, like very soon afterwards, it was... No, I think it took two or three years. Two or three years, right. I but think two or three years. And then 1990, when Kretschmer yes. and Huffman, in right. fantastic piece of right. work, who I feel should also yes. have shared in our, discover in our, mm -hmm. in our accolade. Um, I think it's a wonderful piece of work. They can't because they're not English. They couldn't have been knighted, I guess. Well, I, that, but I think they could have shared the Nobel oh, Prize. I that's right. <laughs> I mean, the, the knighthood is, a, is, is a, well, that, that's an interesting thing. But I feel a little bit uh, um, peculiar about that. Uh, I feel peculiar about the prize as well, because um, it's a funny prize. But um, uh, when their extraction uh, yeah. was published, then everybody knew it was absolutely right. But it, in fact, there, was, there were a lot of question marks hanging over it all the period. Um, I was convinced within about six or seven months, um, because I'd found uh, another argument, with sort of theoretical argument, then Rick Smalley's group had actually uh, done some very interesting further work which had looked pretty good. Um, but then it was, so it's 1990, and then there was a period of where lots of interest was shown, and it was shown to be fascinating material. But it still hasn't uh, ha got a, a, a real application in, uh, in that sense. And, but, it, but it has a very exciting possibilities. But then so had li li liquid crystals. I mean, liquid crystals took 100 right. years before we got what we have watch in my watch. Is. I mean, it took, not only did you have to understand how liquid crystals operated on a microscopic scale, a molecular level, but you had to have batteries and semiconductors and these sorts of materials until you could use it as a display device and a 50 to 100 years of understanding of molecular dynamics. And I think C60 is in that same mold. It's so different from anything we had before, we have to know what it will do before we will find an application. What's very amazing about uh, this discovery of yours is that you actually were not looking for it. Pre I presume you were looking for something in the stars. Yeah. How, how, is this, how does one make the leap from going from, uh, I guess, a red giant or, uh, yeah. that you were working on and spectroscopy, which to well, finally now doing things in the yeah. lab and... Uh, it's the way, like, going, it's going down the road. I mean, you know, um, it's really a, a voyage of discovery and it's really a, an exploration because uh, the work that I was doing in the 70s was on carbon chains with my colleague David Walton at Sussex. Does this relate somehow to Professor Burbage's uh, uh, at the uh, UCSD? I probably so loosely. I'm not sure there's, I mean, obviously there's some involvement with carbon, and, but I mean, carbon's a fascinating material, not only on a, a chemical level. I mean, all, the whole of biochemistry is carbon, mm -hmm. and the whole of our organic chemistry is carbon, and the reason that carbon is in the universe at all. Are, so how does one jump from there? One looks at the stars and suddenly one well, it's starts making right. uh, things and starts playing with soccer It's not course. very difficult. I mean, the, the experiment was, was set up with Rick Smalley through Bob Curl originally because I was interested in the material that was blown out of a carbon star. I mean, we were all formed from carbon that originally was formed in a carbon star. That star blew up and the carbon then was distributed into space. And I had the thought that maybe this carbon was in the form of chains. And I wanted to show that. And Rick had developed a fantastic apparatus which would form carbon clusters. And I thought these clusters wouldn't be stuck together. I thought they might be carbon chains. When we did the experiment, we found, first the good news, yes, there were carbon chains. Now the bad news, there was something else, and that was C60, which was actually a, a round cage, and that was unusual. 
And we, we saw a signal which was a serendipity. It was totally unexpected that not only were there these carbon chain molecules, so the idea that carbon star chemistry uh, was interesting, so that was a good step. Mm -hmm. But then there was something else which we then di that diverted along this track to try and explain why 60 was special. And the reason it's special is the same reason that a soccer ball is special. This is about the most symmetric structure you can make out of little patches. That's very interesting. And uh, you, you know, you, we kick this around, it's a pretty strong structure, and uh, you can kick around carbon atoms, and they have this same very, very beautiful structure. Now, before this, you were, you were working as a chemi in, in other chemistry. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about uh, what was your other work in chemistry? Well, I presume that this was not your main work in... No, my main work was in carbon phosphorus chemistry. I, I've always had involvement with carbon. And uh, I'm most proud of the work that we did uh, with a colleague, John Nixon, and at, at, Su at Sussex, and that was to make the first carbon phosphorus double bond. People didn't think that that sort of molecule could exist. And I was working in chemistry of carbon bonded to second row atoms. And that was very good. I, I could have died happy with just that. And then with a colleague, David Walter, uh, we, we did some work um, with an undergraduate, actually. Mm -hmm. It was a very good in undergraduate, Alexander, to make long carbon chain molecules for real fundamental purposes. You know, these long yeah. were very simple and they mm -hmm. vibrate. And I thought, well, a bit like a skipping rope. You know, what can you, you know, when kids play with a skipping yeah. rope, you can, you can do things and they will vibrate. Is chemistry really like this? I mean, you have yes. these images about yes, balls and, absolutely. Skip, yeah, and skipping it, ropes. And yeah, you have structures this, uh, and Buckminster Fuller downs. Yeah. I mean, chemistry is, and physics too, but chemistry, we are architects. Well, you know, we physicists uh, always talk about the Schrodinger equation and complicated things. Yeah. And in fact, is chemistry, is, can one think in these yes, models? And absolutely. In fact, this is actually... When I see benzene, yes. I see a building on almost on this nanoscale. When I see C60, I see a Buckminster Fuller dome. When a chemist sees a, 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 a formula, he can see this as a tangible object. He doesn't, it's a sort of abstraction. But just as you, since when you see a formula or right. quantum mechanics, you see in that formula wave functions and also the implications as far as um, uh, things like superconductivity are concerned. Right. We can make that jump. But just like someone else, you say Macbeth, and they see in that, from right. that one word, they see the plumbing of the depths of human spirit, both good and bad. And Macbeth was a great man and a bad man. He was the greatest good and greatest bad man at the same time. And Shakespeare plumbed out, just as chemists have plumbed the beauty of this microcosmic world and physicists of the nuclear particles. It seems like you believe actually that we can see actually images that electrons are little balls and... Uh, well, yes, and I mean, we do see that. I mean, I think we do have those images. Um, the, the, some, some scientists will certainly have, see that in the mathematics, but there will be some, I think, pattern, an image, and there's always a pattern behind everything, even if it's only a pattern on, of the way the wave function can be drawn or in the way that the operators will move in matrices. I think there's always a pattern somewhere. It may not be a, a spatial pattern. So your, your main work, actually, that led to all this was in stellar evolution. So if I would be a real interviewer in a commercial TV, I would ask you, so what is the point of working on stellar evolution? What well, would you say to that? Well, I, I wouldn't go as far as stellar evolution. I would say that one of the interesting aspects of this is that we've discovered the form in which carbon in a star comes out of that star and forms a direct path from the star to the biosphere. So we now know, and carbon, as we say, is necessary for life. So we, we really understand a bit more about life at the earliest stages than we did before. I would like to actually ask you something about your personal, uh, uh, personal question, if I may. Uh, can you, we have known each other for a number of years and we are colleagues and now you have been put into this our is. stars. Yes. You, are, you are one of our stars. How has this changed your life? Has it, uh, not all for the good, mm -hmm. um, but um, it, it's completely changed. I mean, I, in a way that's only now becoming clear because one becomes public property and um, people outside science think you're, you know, have a high, very high IQ and that you must be a genius. And when, does, you know, you, you don't need to be a genius to, to do this. You have to be a good scientist and you have to really uh, follow things up and uh, this teamwork is involved in this and then be very lucky. What do you mean be a good scientist? You, say, you said that several times in the program. I think you have to be, to, to get above a certain level and, and, and continue to do science and not, just for its own sake. 
I mean, to do things that just interest you and be your own person. I mean, don't take any notice of other people. If they think it's not worth doing, just still do it because, um, in fact, the discovery of C60 was out of a, a, um, a, a problem that I was particularly interested in, rather mundane. I mean, I, I wasn't desperate to do this experiment. Mm -hmm. I walked into Rick's lab and said, mm, this apparatus can do this experiment. I mean, yeah. this was brilliant piece of apparatus. Small is apparatus yeah, yeah, which had, was for the first time could, could produce mm -hmm. little bits of refractory materials you know, 20 iron atoms stuck together. And I thought, well, maybe this can simulate the conditions in the carbon star. And not many, in fact, nobody else was interested in that. And it was a mundane I'd think, well, I can do it now. I, I didn't even think about doing it. But I saw that this experiment, this technique, Which, uh, and, and I, I thought we could do it. And, and then we were able to do it. And, but it's changed my life in the sense that now people outside yes. chemistry and physics and science think that you're important. And that's not necessarily, that's good and bad about it because one feels like a, f a spokesperson for the chemi chemistry and physics community and the science community. And that's a rather large burden. And I feel like in Britain I have to do this because, you know, we haven't had a Nobel Prize for a long time, whereas you had five last year. It was one, I was one of six people, in, yes. uh, three physicists and, th and three chemists were five. So you got a lot of them. Um, a lot of them are expats, of course, and, and think, or second, first and second generation expats. As I, am I yes. from, from my parents from, from Berlin, but uh, I do feel a pressure on that, and I feel I have to do it. Well, it's changed my life that way. We're out of time. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed this edition of uh, UCSD guest book, where my uh, guest today was her Professor Harold Croto, Professor Sir Harold Croto, Harry Croto, Harry, Harry Croto, <laughs> to the 1996. <laughs> winner of the Chemistry Nobel Prize for the discovery of Buckminster Fullerene. Harry, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to have you, and thank you for joining us today.